Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And it's great, great to be back again to, I guess, give a follow up to my last webinar. And I'd like to acknowledge the Cabby Cabby and Chinumbara peoples of the Sunshine Coast area where I am today. And also acknowledge all the traditional custodians of the wet tropics, the focus of today's presentation. So I, I guess in the last presentation, I tended to focus on what the latest science is telling us about climate change. I, I did talk about impacts as well, but today I want to take that to the next step, which is responding to climate change. And the title of this presentation is Exploring Climate Resilient Develop Development Pathways and Opportunities, because there will be opportunities for the wet tropics region over the next few decades. And to do so in the context of how climate adaptation, particularly in the latest IPCC report, tends to be more aligned now with the sustainable development goals. So that's why I've fitted into their development pathways. That seems to be the approach that's being taken in the climate adaptation and resilience space in particular. So we'll see how we go today. Some material today is very new and will actually be appearing in my book. So you're seeing stuff probably for the first time with any audience that I've shared it with. So I hope you find it useful and interesting. There's a bit of, a lot of the material might be a little bit dense in terms of the slides, but I will go through it fairly quickly. And this, I'm very happy for this presentation to be shared, um, obviously as a presentation, but also if people want a copy of the actual slides, I'm very welcome to share those, or you can just take a photo, whatever's easy. Right, so first slide. So just a bit of a recap um, to begin with on what the climate change projections were for the wet tropics, because that was I spoke about that a few weeks ago. Then I'm going to talk a little bit more very quickly, though, about potential impacts on different sectors in the wet tropics, the ones that are relevant, particularly to NRM. Then I'll, have a, I'll throw a little bit of theory at you, which is lovely on a Wednesday afternoon, just to get you thinking a bit of how theoretical aspects of, of how we respond to climate change. Then I'd focus today on just looking at one large sector that's, I can't cover tourism or energy. I, I have done that in the book, but obviously I can't cover all of that in one webinar. So today I thought I'd focus on what I think is core to terrain's business, the agricultural and sustainable land management in the wet tropics. Two things I'll be looking at is the how, we, how to develop climate resilient development pathways and opportunities, and how you can integrate those with the S. So that's problem today. Doesn't work there. Sorry, this thing a bit funny. Try again. So just very quickly, um, some of the things I mentioned last time, th these are just the, uh, if you like, what's likely to happen in terms of confidence. So very high confidence is very highly likely to happen through to lower confidence that's maybe two to three times out of out of a hundred, sorry, two to three times out of 10 chance of happening. So we are expecting warming, obviously, both of the atmosphere and also the oceans around the wet tropics and the coastal areas, the Great Barrier Reef, and in particular, having uh, increases in overnight temperatures, probably increasing at a faster rate than maximum or afternoon temperatures because of that greenhouse effect. Expecting obviously an increase in hot days, um, but also marine heat waves. And in particular, they, they will increase in frequency and also duration, so longer lasting heat waves, um, marine, marine heat waves as well. Sea level will continue to rise and we'll be watching that very closely because of developments in, in some of the uh, sort of Greenland and also West Antarctica, where we're starting to see these sort of nonlinear changes occurring in sea level. Um, obviously, if you rise temperature, you also increase evapotranspiration. I perhaps didn't mention, though, we're expecting an increase in the trade winds as well. Um, so that, that'll drive evaporation, but it could also bring more rain in off the coral sea in the dry season. So there's a lot of, a lot of sort of unknown things out there as well. But increase in the trade winds, not so good for tourism, of course. Um, Increases in extreme day, daily rainfall events. We're already seeing that happening across Australia and globally about the wet tropics, it'll be a feature as well. Um, drought, of course, when we have strong El Ninos will be a feature and we're expecting an increase in El Ninos in the future. This is re research that's come out 
in the latest IPCC report. So that means, um, believe it or not, sort of much uh, less uh, intense wet seasons and obviously much drier weather during the dry season. So that brings a higher risk of fire into the system. It'll also impact on agriculture. Cyclones, yes, we expect them to become more intense, but less frequent. And there's some evidence that we're expecting a slowing of the forward motion of tropical cyclones. So they are going to potentially sit put for longer, leading to more extreme events because of their slower speed. Um, rainfall is interesting because really for the from all of northern Australia, there's not really any clear trend in, in the modelling. You may also flip a coin um, as to whether it's going to get wet or drier. So it's best just to plan adaptation around rainfall, like total rainfall for the year being roughly the same, still having a wet season, still having a dry season, but also um, having those more extreme events when they do come along. So that's a very quick recap. Uh, what are some of the potential impacts? So I'll just list some of these for, when I talk about land, I mean the broader land sector uh, that includes you know, protected areas or crown land areas, but also in the NRM sense, agriculture and land are inseparable in, in modern approaches to sustainable NRM. So I'll just say agriculture and land sectors. Um, we're obviously issues, believe it or not, for the wet tropics of, of water security. And that's why Cairns Regional Council are getting a little bit antsy at the moment about water supply for a growing city. Um, clearly in the low-lying low areas, we expect more of the saltwater intrusion um, increasing temperature and evaporation. Uh, you might get a bit of a CO2 effect that might help crops for a while, um, but they'll, they'll reach a point where you get called CO2 saturation and increasing the CO2 doesn't necessarily increase the water use efficiency. So we're talking about impacts there on soil carbon. We don't want to see soil carbon that we've gone to a lot of trouble to collect or to put into the soil, return back into the atmosphere and actually fueling the greenhouse effect. Um, interesting bit of research around um, some tropical crops and this idea of you need these cool days to for inductive days for flowering and these tend to be overnight cool night overnight temperatures. If we've got warming overnight, overnight temperatures this could have impacts on crops like mangoes um, and potentially as time goes on we might see heat sensitive crops and livestock having to be relocated elsewhere. This is probably more of an issue for other parts of northern Australia where like the Northern Territory, for example, in the Gulf Country, where it's just going to become very, very hot. Not so much on the East Coast where you've got the tempering effect of the ocean. Um, yes, fire security is, is not going to go away. It's, it's, in fact, it's going to get worse and we're going to need to have experts in that because um, all of these sort of biosecurity agents could actually increase their impact um, and there might be new invasive species that might be introduced. We also might actually see a lot of our tropical pests and weeds actually moving south, becoming a problem down south. So potentially exporting our problem. However, we can also export our expertise. So there's an opportunity there on the expertise side. Now heat stress in cattle is interesting. I've shown some cattle here. Um, you know, we do have, have obviously have quite a lot, a large amount of cattle in the terrain in our NRM region, particularly in the upper Herbert. Um, but heat stress is a big issue for dairy herds. And although the that's an issue in terms around their uh, reproduction, uh, but also it can actually lead to mortality. So the kind of heat waves we're expecting to see in the future could impact on, on some of those herds. Actually, the tablelands though should perhaps be positioning itself in the medium term, that one by medium, I mean sort of 10 to 30 years, actually having some advantages of its elevation, its cooler climate and also being a little bit further away from the coast, so less exposed to cyclones, not totally protected, but less exposed. There's potential there for relocation of some agriculture. We're already seeing that happening already from, from some of the coastal areas. But that will come off with trade-offs of, you know, with conservation of biodiversity and also such as Marby Forest, but also just urban, potential for urban growth on the tablelands is also very high too. So there'll be a lot of trade-offs there around agriculture. Uh, there might be some short-term benefits you get from extra CO2 in the atmosphere because it is the toughest fertiliser. Um, and we might see this with sugarcane and, and some of the other crops as well. 
Um, you know, greenhouse studies have shown that if you increase the CO2, you increase the productivity of sugarcane, for example. The biodiversity I've put, I've linked tourism to biodiversity here. So it's more in, in the sense of it's so critical to our tourism industry. Uh, it's the mainstay, people come to see our biodiversity. So we're expecting, you know, without doubt, we are going to see some rainforest areas impacted by more severe tropical cyclones and also these El Nino droughts and potentially being followed up by, with bushfires. We've already seen that in, in, in recent years, particularly 2019-20, where areas of rainforest were burnt. Not so much the wet tropics, only some places, but particularly Yungala, but also getting down into the Gondwanan rainforest areas. So the wet tropics is not immune from that, um, but it probably has a little bit more of a buffer because it is just so much wetter uh, and less exposed to drought compared to those other sites. But as time goes on, it, there's greater potential for, for fire and rainforest. And this, of course, when you increase cyclone intensity and you have fire frequency increasing, you, you start to impact on the forest structure and composition. So those sort of changes. We already know from Steve Williams' work and some of his colleagues that we are facing potential extinction of some of our charismatic cool adapted endemics, such as the, this um, species here, the lemuroid ringtail possum. Um, that might be one of the canaries in the coal mine in terms of what's happening on the land and coral reefs, of course, being, being the equivalent in, in the tropical oceans. Um, Another thing that I've been sort of interested in, I had a student did this as part of a, an honours project quite a few years ago is, you know, this, there's an image here of um, cloud, you know, cloud forest, uh, which is important in the tropics. And we know that these forests strip water out of the atmosphere, it's called cloud stripping, and it can be quite significant in the dry season. In fact, 80% of the yield into the catchment in the dry season is coming from cloud stripping. And that's important for keeping perennial streams flowing. As you increase your temperatures, you push your cloud base up and therefore you're reducing the amount of forest that's providing this ecosystem service. And this has potential for aquatic ecosystems, water supplies, for agriculture and also towns. So that's something also to keep in mind. There are some places in the world where they're expecting to lose some ecosystems. Lord Howe Island has got this peculiar cloud forest on one of its higher peaks. And it's only going to take one, one and a half degrees of warming and the cloud base will get too high and that system won't be able to persist anymore. Um, obviously, we, we keep hearing about mass bleaching events on the reef and, you know, we're getting to the point where every time we have an El Nino now, we can pretty well expect to have mass bleaching because we've now had it both in neutral years, but actually also this year, we don't know how bad it is yet. Also in the line so the, the, the rainforest-based tourism basically plays second fiddle to the reef tourism. So its survival is dependent on having that reef tourism. It, it, so that's quite critical when you talk to some of the rainforest operators like Skyrail, they say that if people don't come to see the reef anymore, they're, they're probably going to lose a lot of customers. So there's that kind of knock-on effect. And of course, the, we are hearing about the risk of losing world heritage status. Um, if you can't maintain world heritage values, you can no longer be considered for world heritage status. And this is also a risk that's looming over the reef at the moment. We're waiting for the UNESCO report uh, a little bit, well, back two or three months from now, we should hear about that. Uh, so that's a bit of doom and gloom. Um, now heat waves, we, we don't think about heat waves in, in Northeast Australia, they, they do occur, but they're, they're something we don't normally think about. And of course, here's an example of the 2019, sorry, November 2018 heat wave that uh, lasted for three or four days and smashed the records for both Cairns Airport and the showgrounds, where it was 42.5, I think, for two days in a row. It did lead to, to human impacts. There, were, there was mortality and morbidity associated with that. And of course, there was a large loss of um, spectacle flying foxes as well. Um, now, these heat waves are often made worse by a combination of humidity and high temperatures, so impacting the heat index. And these extreme heat waves, something you wouldn't have thought about 30 years ago, are something we might see more often. And having one in November of this intensity is kind of unusual. It's a bit early in the summer, so that was a bit of a wake-up call. So some of the things for human health and well-being, um, 
you know, an, we, we've got an aging population. That's 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 a well known fact. And we also know in rural areas, regional Australia, there are more old people than there are in the cities because young people tend to move to the city, so it affects that demographic. And old people really, unfortunately, don't tolerate extreme heat events as well as younger groups. So that's an issue. Um, we also know that people who are from disadvantaged groups, uh, people with disabilities, remote settlements, indigenous communities are more vulnerable to all forms of extreme weather events, not just heat waves. If you just look at what's happened recently in Lismore, it's this, this particular low economic, low income economic that is being impacted more severely. Um, and also potentially workers, you know, people have to work outside. Um, there might be be a need to change the way that people work. There might be more night work done using, using lights, for example, for road workers. They're kind of doing this now anyway, for other reasons. But also people are more likely to have accidents, um, you know, chop their fingers off and do silly things like that um, dur during these um, periods of increased temperatures. And it affects their decision-making. Um, the other issue we've seen, of course, is this, these risks associated with river and flash flood events. Um, they're, they're now considered our most expensive extreme weather event in Australia. Not in terms of deaths, that's heat waves, but in terms of just the costs. And um, you've probably heard, you know, some of the work that's coming out about, you know, 20% of all properties be uninsurable by 2030. This is latest modelling work from the Climate Council. So there are issues there around not just river iron flash flooding, but also coastal flooding as well. Here's my next slide. Um, and there's a whole bunch of knock-on effects. I'm not an expert in these areas. I've re read all this for my book, but we know that it affects, you know, mental health, anxiety, particularly in the farming communities associated with droughts and so on, and absenteeism um, and reduced agricultural productivity. So there's a whole lot of human health and wellbeing factors we need to think about. There's also issues, This is, I'm only touching on this, but the um, Ab Aboriginal cultural values that are, vulnerable to climate change and the idea that biocultural diversity are inseparable and totemic species, many of these may be impacted. Um, and also lo loss of um, traditional sites in, in low-lying areas or coastal areas due to coastal flooding and sea level rise. Uh, many traditional owned groups have raised this as a real issue they're concerned about. There's also issues around um, losing traditional bush tucker foods might become less available and reforced dietary changes. And there's this whole issue around justice, social justice, inequitable power structures, and the ability for Aboriginal communities to actually respond to climate challenges and to care for country. Now, the caveat there is that we need to work more closely with our traditional owner groups because they have been through 60,000 years of living on this continent, and they've endured many climate change events in the past, including sea level rise at one point was increasing by a metre a century at the end of as we came into the, into the current uh, interglacial period, and that's currently what we're looking at over the next hundred years: sea level rising about a meter in a century due to human causes this time. So there is this knowledge there about how you respond to a rapidly changing um, coastal environment. So we need to work more closely with our traditional owners to uh, have them involved in all the decision making. Um, obviously, critical infrastructure, this is important in NRM as well. You have to have your roads and your, your power networks and so on. We do know that coal-fired generators tend to, believe it or not, they, they don't do very well in heat waves. They tend to fail. Air conditioning goes through the roof and the system just can't cope. Um, a more modern um, power system, you know, that, that's being mooted, that's more decentralised, will overcome a lot of these issues. And that's the way we need to be going in terms of you know, weaning ourselves very quickly off fossil fuel based energy. Fingers crossed. Um, and of course, we're expecting more increased flooding and cyclone risk that some, some locations may become uninsurable or they're already becoming very expensive now. And people are making decisions to no longer insure their properties. Uh, all of this comes with a whole lot of potential costs to society because if people lose their homes, they have to go somewhere and they may have lost everything they've ever had. So we need to think about wise ways of dealing with that. And literally that will disadvantage some groups over others. Um, 
water scarcity in some areas will increase because there'll be increasing competition amongst urban agricultural and, and environmental needs. We have to still make sure we provide environmental flows for our waterways. Um, we don't want to be cutting them off completely. We need to make sure we keep those flows there as well. I mentioned cyclones. Sorry, I don't know why I did that. Um, yeah, that was the last one. The risk for greater uh, wind damage and more prolonged rain events associated with these slower moving cyclones. So that's a bit of a quick one there, but I want to go through a few definitions just to sort of get you thinking in the IPCC space. Um, now, this word mitigation in the IPC sense refers only to this. We, we can mitigate the effects of flooding. So sometimes we use this word mitigation when we're really talking about adaptation. But in, in the IPCC language, mitigation is really just this. It's basically about reducing the flow or emissions of, of heat trapping greenhouse gases. And this means by reducing sources, such as fossil fuel sources in particular, or enhancing the sinks. So in the NRM space, both of these are things where the community can, can play a role. It can, it can be involved in reducing emissions uh, by moving towards uh, other forms of energy for machinery and so on, but also in particular around enhancing sinks. So this is where carbon sequestration, uh, blue carbon, store carbon, all these sort of things come, in, come into play. So when I talk about mitigation, I'm, I'm referring to this strictly um, scientific def definition of mitigation. That doesn't mean you can't use the other mitigation if you want to use it in an, ad in an adaptation context. Um, I use this word malmitigation. I didn't invent it, but it's out there. It's the opposite. Now, this is when you've got changes that could reduce greenhouse emissions in the short term. So a kind of short term fix, but could inadvertently lock in technology choices or practices that have significant trade offs for the effectiveness of future adaptation, other forms of mitigation. And the one that really stands out to me, and I go on a bang on about it in my book, is this federal government gas-led recovery roadmap. This smells or stinks of malmitigation. Um, and it, it's gonna come back and bite us on the bum one day. It, it's very, very poor um, climate policy indeed. It's just totally unnecessary to have any of this gas lead recovery. But anyway, we've, we've got it um, and we're stuck with it for a while. Um, adaptation, of course, is, is when you're looking at ways of, of managing uh, climate change. Now, it can be autonomous. So a lot of the adaptation we're looking at within natural systems or ecosystems is some of it will be autonomous. There'll be some species that are more plastic, they will tolerate warming temperatures or changing rainfall better than others. And there'll be others that will be less plastic and they might be the ones that will go extinct. Um, but you can have autonomous adaptation within social as well. Uh, but autonomous just means within, self-producing. But most of what we're looking at when we think about adaptation to climate change is planned responses to actual, so you've been experiencing it already, possibly over the last decade or so or longer, but also potential climate changes that you're, you're um, going to be dealing with in the future that you've got a very high, um, you know, there's a high probability that they will occur. So potential climate change would be where no sea level is going to rise by up to a metre by the end of the century, regardless of what we do now, it's pretty well locked in. So you can already, you can say it's potential um, in, into the future. And you're looking at how this affects both your natural economic and social systems. You can also apply planned adaptation to ecosystems as well. You, you can, for example, enhance their resilience to climate change, such as through increasing connectivity in the landscape so species can move. And in extreme case, translocating species to a cooler climate, whether we're talking marine systems or terrestrial systems. So you can have planned adaptation as well within, as within natural systems. Um, so plan adaptation, it's deliberate policy decisions to, towards uh, an achieved desired state. Now, plan adaptation, um, basically, you're trying to respond to observed or potential climate change, but there are two kind of um, forms of plan adaptation. Um, the one that we've really been doing now in the NRM space, farmers have been doing this in some parts of Australia for probably three to four decades, maybe longer, 
has been incremental um, adaptation. So they've basically been gradually making changes in how they do their business due to a changing climate. Uh, and this might be a gradual process. So an example I've given here is a farmer deliberately planting a more drought tolerant crop to align with declining rainfall in the area. So we've got lots of examples of incremental adaptation in agriculture, particularly in Southwest Australia, but also in Southern parts in Southeastern Australia where the climate has already been changing. It's been getting warmer and drier. This, this is not such an issue yet in, in the wet tropics, except what is happening is it is getting warmer, even though rainfall isn't, isn't really changing. So there might be some examples already out there. So this incremental adaptation will, will do us well for a while, um, but it can't go on forever. Eventually things will start to break down. Uh, and then we need to be thinking about transformational adaptation. Um, and this is when it starts to get very complex. It starts to get very expensive. It leads to high risk of social disruption. Uh, an example here might be um, deliberate relocation of an entire community or industry to a new location to avoid rising sea levels or warming temperatures. So for example, there's talk about possibly relocating parts of the Lismore CBD to a new location. Uh, or in the meantime, potentially just increasing the levy, which is incremental. But when you start making fundamental changes to your social ecological system, uh, you are entering a new territory that um, there aren't many examples of this in history. It has occurred in history. People were once in Greenland and they left. Uh, and that was largely driven by a, a climate change within the Atlantic Basin. It wasn't a global warming effect. And then the, then the little ice age came and people had to get out. And that happened pretty quickly. It happened within probably 50 years. So it, we can do it, but not from a sort of modern society that we have today. So it's going to be very challenging. Occasionally, though, um, um, you do get maladaptation. And um, this is when actions that might lead to an increased risk of adverse climate related outcomes. Uh, for example, it might lead to increasing greenhouse gas emissions, more increased vulnerability or diminished welfare now or in the future. So maladaptation could be very costly um, if, it, if it's something that we see governments doing maladaptation and not realizing it. So it tends to be a perverse outcome of poorly conceived societal responses to manage climate change effectively. This is both malmitigation, I mentioned the gas lead recovery is an example of that, and maladaptation as well. An example where we perhaps have fallen into this trap is we had Australia had fantastic momentum in the climate adaptation space. Uh, which uh, up until about 10 years ago, we were world leaders in climate adaptation. We had the National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility. We had a CSIRO climate adaptation flagship. That all disappeared when the climate wars started and governments started cutting those programs. So we've actually lost about a decade of momentum in the climate adaptation space. Okay, so here's a, a very quick sort of uh, uh, idea of what, we, what we're going to be looking at today. So we might start over here with mitigation, um, but really we're starting off with our natural economic and social systems, and they have particular coping ranges. Um, and we, we apply mitigation to those to ultimately deal with greenhouse gases. Malmitigation is when we actually don't, we, we in fact do that wrong in a wrong way. Um, Greenhouse gas emissions, increasing greenhouse gas emissions lead to climate change. So do decreasing climate, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. They lead to cooling of the climate. Um, but in this case, we're increasing them. Um, the potential impacts they might have on a social system, a natural system, or an economic system will really depend on the exposure of that system and its sensitivity uh, to change. So exposure is a kind of external part of vulnerability. Sensitivity is the internal part of vulnerability. And that will lead to potential impacts. On the right hand side, though, we've got a whole lot of things that drive adaptive capacity in those systems. Um, some of that is autonomous adaptation, uh, and that can be measured in different ways. Uh, also, willingness to adapt. So if you've got if you've got social systems and economic systems that are engaged in climate adaptation, then you're halfway there. All right. But also other things like your socioeconomic, institutional and governance structures and natural capital. 
And we all know that natural capital is so important um, to build resilience to climate change. And by example of natural capital, I mean, for example, our soils. The, the amount of carbon in our soils is, is an example of natural capital. So is biodiversity, um, maintaining ecosystem services, all those sorts of things are part of our natural capital. Now, we're in a wealthy, highly developed economy. We've got well-developed um, institutional and governance structures, I hope we have, compared to say our neighboring developing countries. So that, you know, that, that's part of it. But if we were applying this model, say to uh, a country like Bhutan, for example, we, we'd be dealing with a very diff different mix of socioeconomic, socioeconomic and governance structures. So once you've got some handle on those, we've got some idea of adaptive capacity. From that, we can start thinking about how vulnerable that system might be, what's its coping capacity, and we can think about resilience and risks. And then we might want to think about ways of minimising damage and adaptation costs. So this is where planned adaptation comes in, into the system, I've already given that definition. And maladaptation also plays out here as well. Um, and of course, maladaptation is when you're taking the wrong kind of pathway. So I don't want you to dwell on that diagram too much. I will come back to it a little bit later on. I will keep moving because time is short. I'll just sort of share this doozy diagram with you. Um, I want you to think about how we move through an ad 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 basically an adaptive landscape responding to changes in climate over time. So what we have is we start off with the present day, um, but I, we've got, we've inherited um, some antecedent pathways. So these are decisions that have been made in the past, be they good or bad. Probably most of them have been pretty bad. Um, but nonetheless, we inherit those. And then we go through a series of, um, if you like, decision cycles. These little circles here are shown over here. So we do things like reassess the climate effect of decisions and the overall goals. We look at potential impacts within the decision lifetime. We think about adaptation options and minimising risks. We do our monitoring um, and implementation, and we, then it takes us back to the beginning again. And then we can follow these pathways through time. So these, these um, black lines are incremental adaptation pathways. They're the ones that have been most dominant over time. They're these smaller changes that we make as we go along. Now, it may well be that here we've got our adaptive space. Here's our maladaptive space. So this particular decision, number B, moves into maladaptive space. You go through a decision cycle and you end up at a maladaptive dead end. So you, that's it, you reach that point, you can't take that pathway any further. And likewise over here, you might have a case where you move into maladaptive space, but you're able to bring yourself out fairly quickly uh, and back into adaptive space again. But as time goes on, you've, you've had all this incremental adaptation, it's, it's been sufficient to keep you going. And suddenly, here's an example, uh, vector D, so you, you've gone through uh, incremental adaptation, it hasn't worked, you've moved into maladaptive space. Um, so an example might be you can't grow that crop anymore, it's just not possible, or your yields are so low that it's not economically viable. So you have the option of going into a maladaptive de de dead end, or you could adopt a transformative pathway. Now that transform transformative pathway might be you actually relocate. Um, or you put in a new kind of crop, or you have a new kind of business. All of those sort of things are possible. But this, it takes a transformative pathway to bring you back into the adaptive space once again, and then you keep moving through it. I know this is sort of highly theoretical, but the idea here is to try and show to you that this is kind of what happens in climate adaptation. You go through these incremental pathways and they generally work pretty well, but there are times when you have to think about transformative changes. I've mentioned agriculture, but you could apply this to people living in the coastline. You could apply it to an economic system. Uh, there's a whole, it, it's applicable across all kinds of systems, economic, social, and natural systems. Okay, so I think I won't hit you with any more theory now. Um, I'll give you something a little bit more practical. So if you're responding to climate change, this is an example of a very simple adaptation pathway. Um, and this would be applicable whether you're working with um, NRM groups or whether you're working with a council working with all their stakeholders. Uh, it's a similar kind of idea. So you need to be wary of 
well, sometimes they're called enablers. I've called them drivers here, but I think I use the term enablers in the book. Um, these, are these are ways to bring in adaptation pathways. You have to have these things if, it, if it's going to work. And then you've got to deal with a whole bunch of barriers out there. So this example here, this is from Matt Cernock. This is a, a workshop we're running down in Mackay back in 2015, I think it was, with, uh, when JCU and CSIRO were working on a project for climate adaptation in the wet tropics. And the Mackay Wet Sunday region, NRM region, was one of our um, partners. So we're running a workshop, lots of butcher's, butcher's paper, all this sort of thing. But what we're doing is we're taking people through this sort of a process. So first of all, you've got to have information about climate change to share. Otherwise, that's an enabler. And that provides a clear understanding of climate change. But you might be dealing with barriers like misinformation, uncertainty, scepticism. Yes, we did have scepticism in some of our workshops. Then you've got to think about um, assessment of local capacity and potential impact. So the local capacity of the community that you're working with or the group that you're working with or possibly a council. Um, and some councils are going to have much higher capacity than others because they're bigger councils compared to small councils. That's an issue, but it's also an enabler. And this leads you to a common understanding along the pathway of climate change vulnerability, some idea of what the context is going to be. But you then start dealing with negative emotional reactions. So you, that's another sort of barrier to the process, but you have to overcome that. And then you have a beneficial group values, culture, social influence. So you start to build up um, a, from a bottom up approach, group values, whether you're a farmer or whether you're from a conservation group, you do share, uh, you come up with a series of group values that you would agree on. And that is probably that you've got cohesive communities that are sustainable, you've got sustainable agriculture, you've got biodiversity conservation, and you've got livelihoods, those sorts of things. Uh, and the agreement to be solutions focused. So you, you try to break away with all that sort of arguments and separation and you have a solutions focused approach. One barrier though, is that the expectations are solutions would be provided by government. And some work that I've done with the tourism sector in particular, one of the ideas is that we've received from them is that it's up to the government to solve the problems of climate adaptation. Uh, and that's only partly true. It, it does rely on the industry being participants in the process. So there's high expectations sometimes that the government will solve all of these problems. Um, the next thing is you've got this inherent capacity for strategic planning. And this comes when you have willingness to engage in it and adaptation planning. And, but sometimes a barrier at this point can be lack of resources, funding, skills, and expertise. Again, particularly with some of those smaller councils or smaller NRM groups, particularly those that are uh, in more sort of remote areas and some of the Aboriginal communities as well. And by the way, at any point along this pathway, you could suddenly stop because you just reach an impasse and you can't go any further. But you're hoping that by the time you get to the bottom there, You've, you're starting to get into climate adaptation planning, and there are loopholes um, and feedbacks going on all the time through this process. So that's a very simple example, but I think it, it kind of explains what, from what we, what we were trying to do in this workshop. So um, now to just bring in a little bit of the, the sort of wording around climate resilience, um, in particular, the, the new sort of language around it that's coming out of the IPCC. So there's now a much stronger focus on climate resilient development approaches to climate mitigation and adaptation. So you're bringing in the, you're, you're trying to bring in the, sorry, the SDDs, or Ecologically Sustainable Development, or triple bottom line. Um, and here you have um, a definition of what climate resilient development is. So it's a process of implementing greenhouse gas mitigation and adaptation options to support sustainable development for all. Um, and Basically, we now see the rise of development pathways that align with the SDGs. And I'll just give an example of one of those a bit later on where I've attempted to do that. Um, now, what you're trying to do with these pathways is strengthen sustainable development at multiple scales, you eradicate poverty. Well, again, this is very global in perspective. In some countries, it's, it's a, we, we do have pockets of poverty in Australia, of course, but at that, in developing countries, that's clearly a big issue. Um, and you try to sort of come up with these systems transitions and transformations 
while reducing the threat of climate change. And it means having ambitious mitigation, adaptation and climate resilience. So what you're trying to do is basically is you're trying to stop practices contributing to dangerous global warming and maladaptation. In the context of the Paris Agreement, you're trying to keep warming within two degrees above pre-industrial, but preferably 1.5 degrees. So that's what you're trying to do with a climate resilient development pathway. Hey, Steve. You could, sorry? Steve, Monica here. We've got 15 yeah. minutes left on the session, so maybe five more minutes if we've got 10 minutes of okay. questions. I'll do my best, yeah. This, just to quickly though, climate is an extremely emissions intense, sorry, agriculture is an extremely emissions intensive sector. It's about 15% of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that's mainly from processes, livestock, obviously, burping cows, uh, fertilizers, producing nitrous oxides and so on, and also combustion of fuels in agriculture. So basically, you know, running machinery using fossil fuels. Um, the data from the ABS that I'm presenting here includes agriculture, forestry and fishing, but agriculture is by far the biggest contributor compared to the other two. They don't separate it out. Uh, clearly, we're focusing on CO2, but also methane and nitrous oxides. And this just to sort of show you that, sorry, that uh, methane is 21 times more potent than uh, CO2 in its warming effect. Nitrous oxides is 310 times more potent. CO2 lasts for over 300 years in the atmosphere. Methane is a bit short at nine to 15 years, but when it breaks down, it turns into CO2. Nitrous oxides last about 120 years, but you get some idea that CO2 is by far the most um, common greenhouse gas in the atmosphere in the, on the right-hand column. Um, so let's look at mitigation. So what I've tried to do here is just to very quickly, some examples of mitigation pathways in agriculture that I think would be useful for the wet tropics. It's gonna be a little bit busy, but I'll go through one at a time. There's potential scope for the federal government should improve the emissions reduction fund by expanding methods re related to agricultural practices. This needs to pretty well happen immediately if there's a change of government, hopefully. Um, this has been called for by the National Farmers Federation, also by the Business Council of Australia. At the moment, the conditions for the Emissions Reduction Fund are extremely rigid um, and not particularly useful to agriculture or land sector. Um, methane is a big issue because it's potent as a greenhouse gas and basically in extensive livestock systems, really, we're looking mostly at opportunities around pasture management and really offsetting carbon at this stage. So you're offsetting the CO2 equivalent through other offsetting initiatives to the amount of methane that is produced by the livestock. Um, with, with the intensive livestock systems, there's some very exciting work going on around seaweed feed additives. Um, but again, this is sort of in that longer sort of 11 to 30 year horizon. Uh, and that stuff is, is happening very, very quickly. In the so there's more sophisticated work on coming up with alternative hydrogen sinks in the rumen of cattle and sheep, vaccines and livestock breeding. So you actually reduce the amount of methane produced through the rumen. Uh, but that's probably not going to help us with approaching our 2050 net zero emissions target, but it is something that, that can be looked at in the longer term. Clearly, better manure and fertiliser management. This is something that happening now right through to the medium term. But it's going to take a while. There are 50,000 um, uh, uh, recognised broadacre properties in Australia. It's going to take a long time for that to move its way through all of those properties. Obviously, opportunities around nitrous oxide. Uh, these include, you know, a lot of the work that's happening in terms of efficiency of nitrogen use. A lot of the work that's happening in the wet tropics already, because you get all these um, adverse environmental impacts, for, such as water quality. So again, that's happening now through to the next uh, 11 to 30 years, but also trying to manage your inorganic nitrogen relative to crop needs, to slow nitrification and build up with nitrate in the soils. Um, soil water retention, that's an area which is happening now, So you, but there are issues there around water logging. Irrigation is more of an issue on, the on parts of the tablelands. Um, and then thinking about enhancing greenhouse sinks. So here there's opportunities around uh, capture of carbon and storage from photosynthetically derived carbon. 
So this is in your biomass, your soil, your harvested products. Uh, at the end of the day, though, smarter land management can boost farm productivity and store carbon, creating carbon credits that will, they're going to be an important source of off-farm income in the future um, as part of us approaching at zero. So there's a big opportunity for the agricultural sector in terms of deriving off-farm income through carbon credits. Um, oh, sorry, I just mentioned fossil fuel. Obviously, there's, there's move towards nitrogen, sorry, hydrogen powered vehicles, uh, battery, battery uh, operated tractors, they already are available, trucks. So a lot of exciting things happening in that space. A bit more on mitigation. Um, biochar is, is another opportunity um, to increase sinks. There's also blue carbon. I've got to put that on a slide, but that, that's important. Um, and also we need to have very strong regulations around land clearing laws um, to keep our existing stocks of nature-based carbon at or above current levels. Um, and also methodologies to value land sequestration, including the valuation of farming practices that improve or enhance soil carbon storage. That should be happening now. Um, and think about the co-benefits you get of um, things like uh, carbon offsets to provide a storefront for voluntary corporate action. Again, these are all things that we that are happening, but I'm just raising them here. Um, climate change, notably bushfires and drought, they actually present a bit of a risk as well. So we could go to a lot of trouble to, to get a lot of carbon stored in our soil, but then we could find that we start getting droughts and bushfires and we start putting it back into the atmosphere through these positive feedback loops. So you could overcome 10 or 15 years of carbon sequestration could, could, be, could be lost in a week due to a fire, or it could be lost in a season or two during to an extended drought. So that when it becomes pretty depressing, a lot of work would be done all for nothing. Um, and mitigation, we need, it needs to be a whole of systems approach. It needs to look at um, emission budgets. So you've got trade-offs between different parts of the uh, economy. Uh, you also need to be thinking the, about the fact that best management systems actually are already doing a good job. Uh, we're seeing that occurring in the landscape because they are, um, they are integrated across the landscape and, and, and storing carbon and reducing emissions. So just to finish off, I want to just think about planned adaptation. Um, so I might go a little bit over. Uh, basically, we know climate change is going to impact on agriculture in Australia. We know it's going to have impact. The wet tropics is not immune to that. We know that there'll be winners and losers and some businesses may even fail or falter over time. Um, but we also know that adaptation initially will focus on the near term uh, rather than the long term. Mitigation, we can start building that into a longer term approach, but adaptation is very different because it brings in a lot of social dimensions, people, for example. Um, but it's important that both climate variability and climate change are addressed um, seamlessly because they are not, as I said in my first lecture, that they're, they're not uh, separate, they are related. Um, we're going to almost see the need for structural changes in the agricultural and land sectors. So in shifts in land use and increases in average farm sizes, Australia is already seeing increases in average farm sizes. Uh, that wasn't always driven by climate change, but now it seems to be a, a factor that's driving that. And we are going to need these incremental systemic and transformative changes that I, that I was talking about. Incremental will not be enough. It might be enough for a while, but it won't be enough in the longer term. And it's important that it's progressive. So it needs to be resilience focused planning. Also, it needs to focus on the rural settlements, land use, industry, infrastructure and value chain. So you need to be bringing in the whole of the economy because uh, value chains, you know, they've been affected at the moment by the price of fuel, for example. So all of these sorts of knock-on effects can be important. Um, and basically some agricultural communities, agribusiness or parts of the region will have greater capacity to adapt, to adapt than others. So th that's important that we recognise that there will be uh, people, some groups will be better placed to deal with climate change um, and maybe they can help other groups as well. So there can be sharing of knowledge. And scale is going to be pretty important too. The scale of investment in machinery, co-ownership across properties, the scale of supplementation with external income and the size of farm enterprises, which I've already mentioned. 
Um, so let's just think about um, in the early stages, it's essential for government and non-government organisations like Terrain to assist agribusinesses with understanding why adaptation is needed and how they can make it part of their management plans and strategies. So this strategy will also require education, extension activities and information. You just need to have the information. Seasonal forecasts, planting dates, stock productions, all those sorts of things become important. And it, as I said, it'll need to be incremental. And in many ways, initially, it'll be based on best practice. Um, so things we're already seeing, like minimum or no tillage practices, stubble retention, use of irrigation, drought resistant varieties, salt tolerant varieties, heat resilient varieties, all the different varieties, those that can tolerate rising CO2 or take advantage of rising CO2, change planting times, all these sorts of things will become important, nutrient and canopy management. And in some respects, these no regrets practices, that's the term that's used, do not require agribusinesses to make radical changes to their farming operations in the short term. They're just things they can do as no regrets. And uh, we should be encouraging these kinds of practices across the sector. But over time, we will need to see these um, transformative changes in agriculture um, and possibly resulting in changing practices or even geographical like, uh, relocation. Um, so for example, climate uh, examples might be climate change ready crops. Some of the work of the Northern Australia CRC um, are working on some of these things. Climate sensitive precision agriculture, agribusiness diversification and risk management. These are just some examples I've come up with. Uh, yes, relocations of some businesses may be needed. Dairy, horticulture. We know that viticulture, particularly in places like the Barossa, they are looking at buying land up in Tasmania for producing, producing grapes for wine uh, as a long-term need, just to be viable going forward. Uh, but basically incremental adaptation options will eventually start to become um, unviable in the wet tropics. So some of these sorts of things become important. And significant changes may be necessary for some vulnerable areas of the wet tropics, such as diversification agricultural enterprises, transition to different kinds of land uses. So we are going to see more of this, I think, in southwestern Australia, where traditional agriculture will be abandoned and it might move into carbon sequestration, renewable energy production or biodiversity conservation as, others, as other ways of using the landscape rather than actually growing crops. So these are all things to think about. Now, what about the SDGs? Well, I'm not going to go through too much detail except to say uh, here we have the SDGs. I have, hope you've all had a look at those. Um, there's 17 of them. Within them, there's 169 nested targets and there's over 200 associated indicators. So the idea of uh, aligning the SDGs with climate adaptation is quite attractive. It's not just climate adaptation, climate mitigation as well. You're trying to avoid lock-in of path dependency. You're trying I'll try to show you in that time, and therefore you're trying to you're trying to avoid mal-mitigation and maladaptation. You're trying to reduce vulnerability, and you're trying to increase the whole idea of the SDGs of, of intergenerational and intragenerational justice. Um, so what I'd like to show you now is um, just where I've attempted to uh, align the SDGs with agriculture and land sectors uh, for Australia, but I've I've tweaked it for the wet tropics. So this is all. I don't think anybody's ever done this before in Australia, not that I'm aware of. Uh, so that's why I'm really pleased to be able to put it in, in, in the book. So here we've got examples of where we're, we're trying to integrate the SDGs with climate change responses to climate change. I include horticulture, forestry and fisheries and their supply chains in, in this. And in, in italics here, we've got the kind of triple bottom line implications of these strategies. So let's just go through these and then I'll knock off. So you have here a series of goals for SDG2, which is zero hunger. And you might think, why is that relevant to us? Uh, well, it isn't because we export food. So it has relevance to um, countries that um, buy our food that ha do have problems of hunger. So your goal might be producing enough food or fibre for needs, domestic and export, fair and just distribution of food and fibre, and improved nutritional value of produce. 
that's your goals. Your targets are all these listed here. You're trying to increase food security, a healthier global population. And then you have to have things that you can actually measure. So these indicators need to be measurable. So you could have things like undernourishment or mal malnutrition in our trading partners, prevalence of obesity in the domestic um, situation. We've got too much food, they don't have enough food. <laughs> Um, and of course, food insecurity based on the United Nations Food Security Experience Scale. So you can bring in SDG2 as critical in agriculture. Clean water and sanitation, well, that goes without saying. So there you're thinking in terms of targets, improve water quality entering waterways like the GBR Lagoon, sustainably increase water use efficiency, uh, integrated water resources management. So they're the kind of things that you think you'll be thinking about in terms of sustainable management of water both quality and quantity of water. Uh, but also there you've got your indicators. So these are things that you, you can measure. Um, so you're looking at some of these things associated with freshwater resources and water bodies with good ambient water quality or in our case, waterways and so on. So again, a lot of the work that we do on the, the, the report card, for example, the Tropics Waterways report card would fit in very nicely with this SDG 6. SDG 7 is very much about energy. Um, it's about ex ex supporting the extension of renewable energy so we can meet the 2050 targets. So you help, want to help farmers have um, growers and businesses have better resilience to energy price shocks. Uh, we've just seen a terrible shock with the Ukraine war. It's had a heck of a shock because of our reliance on, on um, basically fossil fuels. And you're also looking for lower emissions from energy use. So you might want to be thinking about how you might measure that for energy. So I've just listed some things there, um, including percentage of renewable energy use across the sector. You're looking at emission measurements, all those sorts of things. Um, again, these are things that are tenable, you can measure them. Uh, we also then have responsible consumption production uh, as another STG. Again, there we're thinking here about increased natural capital. We're thinking about more productive environments. Targets might be increased efficiency, improved environmental health, and also greater stores of value for future productions needs. So carbon and biodiversity, for example. And again, I've come up with, a, I won't go through all of these now because of time, but a whole lot of indicators that you could use to um, monitor uh, how you're tracking in terms of 2030 targets for the SDGs. And also there'll be another set of targets that come out after the, the 2030 targets will come out by the United Nations. So again, these are things I think would be very useful. Uh, this other slide, I'm focusing on the last three SDGs that are applicable to agriculture and the land sector. SDG 13, by the way, if you're looking at climate change, is applicable to all of the sectors that you look at. So you're looking here for carbon neutral production, resilience and adaptive response to natural hazards. So, um, this is where you start bringing in your um, circular economy, your closed, uh, your, to reduce global warming, your sort of closed loop production and supply chains and coming up with ways of, of uh, reducing emissions, but also the percentage of producers with a drought plan, percentage of producers using renewable energy, percentage of farmers using uh, carbon farming or sequestration. So you start getting some measurable indicators that you can use. And then you've got your last two SDGs that are very much about um, natural capital and biodiversity, life below water and life on land. And uh, because we are looking at the marine systems as well as the terrestrial, we want to have life under below water as well. And I've come up with some, and I've also incorporated indigenous science, indigenous knowledge into this as well. So, sorry, it is rather a lot today, but I guess what I was trying to say today was that there is a way where you can um, start bringing together um, climate adaptation and start mapping it over to the SDGs. And there are, therefore, once you've done this mapping, you can then monitor this over time to see how you're tracking. Um, and just to finish off, uh, yes, I do have a book coming out, um, nearly finished, but due to come out in July. This is not what the cover will be, but I'm hoping they can use this image of the Gold Coast. Uh, mainly because it's, it stands out as being critical for climate change. So I'll leave it there um, and I'll hand back to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Steve. Um, as always, an incredibly enlightening presentation. I, I think everyone has probably got a lot out of that. Um, 
I noticed some people have had to leave already, but I just wanted to first thank you so very much for that and note that there's at least three questions in the chat that we will go through. For people who are leaving before then, just a reminder, there's another webinar on the 3rd of June with Dr. Nicole Sleeman about climate impacts on health in the wet tropics, which I think will also be very interesting. Um, but yeah, for those who can stay, perhaps we'll go to some of these questions if that's all right. Um, and uh, if you don't mind, Steve, I, I could read them out to you or you could read them yourself. Oh, you read them out. That way I can have a drink of water. <laughs> yeah, you have a drink of water. Yeah, that was almost an hour of, of talking in regular these lectures um, uh, from your previous, your past. With all this knowledge, information and data, this is the first question from Siggy. Um, how can we change this information into policies in Australia? This is a big question. <clears throat> okay, well, I think a, a change of government will be a good start because it's got to come, you have to have the leadership at the federal level. We've got fantastic leadership in all the states and territories. Uh, in fact, across all, uh, both sides of parliament, you know, so we're seeing the states and territories lead the way. We're seeing the business sector lead the way. Um, so yeah, we, we really, we have to have, um, we've got to end the climate wars and uh, we have to have that leadership and then that will flow through into policy. So yes, what, I think we're on the right track for that. Um, in the meantime, we, we have to do everything we can to start things going because we've got to fill the vacuum that's not being filled by, by, by federal government policy. Mm, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think we're seeing that happening anyway. Certainly the business sector have already said they wanted action on this and um, they're still waiting. So it's, it's being led by the business sector, which is interesting, not just by the green movement it's well beyond the green movement it's about business these days yeah it's very interesting how many people are, are taking action in their own way wherever they can and and certainly in business um now there was another question from bronwyn opie how should local councils be adapting to changing rainfall patterns affecting water security in a way that is climate resilient i think you probably showed that with your sdg mapping but specifically is it better to take measures to reduce demand or increase supply of fresh water um, well, I think it needs to be both. Um, I think there's probably still some scope on the on the demand side and water use efficiency side. Um, you know, in terms of in terms of water supply uh, on the demand side, I think there's a lot. I think there's also a lot of water lost in the system, so it's efficiency. Um, obviously, as the population grows, you are going to get more demand. You are going to need to increase the supply. Um, and again, I'd have to think about that, but I, I think you'd want to make sure that you try to sort of set some, up a process that was within the SDGs so that you were trying to manage it. And putting another dam in is not necessarily a solution because eventually dams fill up. Um, they, you just you lose biodiversity and you create methane, the more mm. material at the bottom of the dam. So, you know, you can actually have a positive feedback to the climate system. So. Um, the answer is both. I think both of them need, need to be carefully managed. Yep. Okay, thanks, Steve. That's a really good answer. Um, the next one comes from Blake. And uh, if the Afford and Tablelands is facing short-term gains with new agricultural production, but a trade-off in an increase in urban development, does that not reinforce that LGAs now need to plan well beyond their current terms than ever before? Absolutely. They need to be they need to be playing with those scales that, that I was talking about, near term, medium and long term. So that they need to be mapping out across that kind of scale, um, mm. time scale. So that, because yes, the, the potentially more people might want to move to the tablelands because it might be attractive in, with changing climate. Um, so there might be Southern refugees coming up to escape the heat and the bushfires. Um, Cairns might be a bit hot, but the Tablelands might be quite pleasant. So, and it's not a massive area, is it? The Athens Tablelands is very small compared to the size of the whole state. So, you know, we have to be very carefully managed and it has some of our best soils. So it really is an issue, I think, to try and manage that. And you can't, you could talk about population caps, a whole lot of things you could talk about, but you have to have that conversation with the community. Yeah. I can see why the SCG mapping that, that you showed us um, is very useful in that frame, because there is so much comple complexity to the, the kind of mitigation and adaptation pathways that we can take. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. So and on to Lucy. So we've got excessive meat and dairy consumption is a bit of an elephant in the room, re-agricultural emissions. What's the NRM sector's, well, I'll ask you what your, your view is, uh, role in addressing this sensitive topic? Yeah, thanks, Lucy. I knew you'd ask something like that. <laughs> um, look, it's interesting because the red meat sector have an aspiration to be carbon neutral by 2030. But if they are to reach that, it'll only be through offsetting. Um, you know, all the sort of technology I was talking about through the rumen, um, that you know, inoculation of the rumen and all, all these sort of things, that, it's such a long horizon thing. Um, so it is a sensitive topic. I don't really want to get into whether or not people should be eating beef or not, but um, it, is, it is a big contributor to the farming sector because methane is 21 times more potent by volume. It's a very... It's an elephant in the room in New Zealand because they, you know, they, they want to be carbon neutral, but they have a lot of sheep and cattle, a lot of dairy. Uh, so for them, it's a real paradox because they want to be clean and green and all these sort of things, but they've got all these issues with dairy, not just in terms of emissions, but also nutrients going into their waterways. <laughs> so it's hardly surprising. So um, I think I think the sector does have a role uh, in that and. I think we're seeing technologies with feedstock. I mentioned for intensive, the seaweed, for example. So I'm not sure what the answer is, Lucy. Um, eat less red meat maybe would be a good thing, but you try and tell the average Australian that it might be problematic. Yeah, uh, we'll let that one go. Thanks, Lucy. Um, on to the next question, and thanks, Steve, for answering that tricky one. Um, uh, Stuart from Terrain has asked, did you discuss the increasing risk of fires in the wet tropics and bleaching events? Are you aware of the risk of a bleaching event and fires occurring simultaneously in the wet tropics and what the cumulative impact might be? Yeah, it's okay. Well, we're more, the good question, Stuart. We're more likely to see coral bleaching occur or mass bleaching events occurring and bushfires occurring during El Nino years. Mm -hmm. simply because that's that's when you've got drier, less rainfall, less cloud cover. So you get coral bleaching and you also get a greater risk for, for bushfires. But sometimes the bushfires, there can be a lag effect on, with, with depending on antecedent conditions. Uh, I'm not so sure about the reef because I'm not a reef expert, but um, cumulative impact, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that because I can only... Um, uh, unless you get heavy rain after you've had bushfires and you've had loss of vegetation cover in a catchment, and you get a lot of sediment going out, uh, that's going to impact some of the inner reefs maybe. Um, but they are probably separate systems and rather than being sort of cumulative impact, unless you're looking at something like tourism. So you've got bushfires scaring people away and you've got coral bleaching scaring people away, then you do get a cumulative impact. Um, but I do think they would be treated um, separately, even though they're more, most likely to occur during El Nino events. And the modelling suggests that we are expecting the Pacific to move more towards being in an El Nino type state more often with greater warming of the atmosphere or, and the oceans. So that's bad news for Australia because it means a greater risk for drought, bushfires and coral bleaching, all those things that we don't really, and that, that we don't really want to hear about. All right, well, on to something uh, hopefully more positive. There's one more question from Bronwyn OP. She says it's cheeky, but I, I think it's a good question to ask you. Do you have any advice about actions that local community groups can take to contribute to climate mitigation and or adaptation with limited funding? And that's our last question. All right, um, look, local groups, all of us can do a bit in, in mitigation. We can all try and reduce our own carbon footprints. Uh, so that's something we can all do um, at that community individual level. Adaptation, we really need to have those policy mechanisms in place um, so that we don't go down those malmitigation pathways that I talked about. There's not much we can do individual at the community level about adaptation. It's, we, we have to have support for that. It's got to come from government through policy change and directing funding into initiatives that, that build resilience. So the most we can do individually is try and is mainly in the mitigation side, reducing our own emissions, doing what we can to get involved in, in land care groups or, you know, 
trying to find ways to take carbon out of the atmosphere. And a good way to do that is planting trees. And that's what community groups do. So we can, we can be part of it. We can also assist with um, the circular economy, trying to, you know, recycling. If, if we don't have to remake things using as much energy, that's a good thing because at the moment, most of our energy is coming from burning fossil fuel, unfortunately. Um, so all of those sorts of things are where we can, the community can play a role. All right, thanks, Steve. There was one more question that snuck in just as I was thinking we're, we're close to the end. So those who are happy to wait a minute. Um, Nikki Swan sent in a question. Does cyclone modeling still show optimum temperatures for development moving further south as temperatures rise? Sure quite yeah, yeah, thanks, Nikki. Um, I didn't talk too much about cyclones, um, just as well, because I go on all day. But uh, there, there's already evidence in both hemispheres that tropical cyclones or typhoons, hurricanes, um, have already shown a poleward movement of a couple of degrees latitude, the average um, tracking latitude, sorry, yeah, latitude. So they're already um, moving further south or further north, depending on which hemisphere you're in. Um, and if this is an issue, probably the wet tropics less so because it's already in the cyclone belt. But where I'm living now, southeast Queensland, is a bit of a sitting duck uh, in terms of um, cyclone risk in the future is looking very bad for places like Noosa, for example. Um, so, yes, it is certainly uh, an issue um, for places further south of what is the current cyclone belt. Mm. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Thank you. I, I hadn't heard that before. Um, so I think that's the end of uh, the question, Steve. You've done fantastically. Um, we went over by 15 minutes, but um, I really appreciate everyone who's hung on to listen to the answers and those who haven't um, will be able to see the recording. So we hope to see you again at one of the future webinars and uh, good luck with your book, Steve. It sounds like you're almost finished. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, Nicole's presentation. Yep. Have uh -huh. that medic the medical perspective, yeah, that'll be great. So I'll, yeah, I'll so we'll, that in the team D. Excellent. Okay. And we'll try to find some more of those kinds of presentations as we move forward. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everybody. See ya.